thank you for tuning in to Front Porch Conversations here at the Advent Christian Village. Today I have as our guest Mark Equid. Mark, thank you so much for being here. And would you tell our viewers what your title is here at the Village? And my uh, title is uh, uh, Vice President of Independent Living Operations. And that's what you, your goal is to keep everybody independent and having keep the services they need. That's right. That's right. You know, society and the senior population keeps changing. Mm -hmm. And uh, people that are wanting to age at home want to be as independent as possible. Our job is to operate right alongside them so they can stay home and we can help them out while they're staying at home. Well, as one of those people, I'm happy that you're going to be doing that. Yeah. And I think the village has a long history. Yes. of coming alongside and doing for others or yeah. helping them to be able to do for themselves. I'm very amazed uh, when I came on campus. It wasn't at all what I expected, what I envisioned when I uh, first uh, learned about the campus. But coming on the campus, it almost reminded me of a college university campus. Just coming on, go, oh, look, all the, look at all the kids out there. <laughs> That's right. Mark, how did you first learn about the village? Uh, I uh, was uh, working uh, as a director of operations for a Methodist church in Wilmington, North Carolina, but I would go to church at the Advent Christian Church in Wilmington called United Advent Christian. And um, I became their uh, pianist accompanist. Uh, and through that process, every fifth Sunday, the Advent Christian churches in the Wilmington area would get together and we'd do a worship and a sing-along and the choirs would per sing and each church would do their thing. Well, they would do a special collection offering. So that's how I learned about the Advent Christian Village. I still didn't know much about it other than I participated in each of those uh, Fifth Sunday Sings, they would call it. Uh, but it wasn't until um, last year, this was after COVID when I uh, left uh, working for the Methodist Church, I got a call from Pastor Sam who became the, uh, the lead pastor out here. And he said, you interested in talking to the CEO? Uh, and it just so happens uh, I was uh, kind of in, in between things. So yeah, started talking to uh, the CEO, Craig Carter. Uh, and that's started uh, uh, just inviting me to come and take a look more at what we were uh, doing out here. Mm -hmm. That's how I learned, it was amazing. Well, let's start a little bit further back. Where were you born and where did you grow up? I am uh, one of five kids. I was, I'm the middle child. I have an older brother and older sister, younger brother, younger sister. Uh, my parents, uh, my dad was a retired uh, military officer, army. Um, and we were born in five different army bases around the world. So I was born in Fort Belvoir, Virginia. And I like to tell people I'm a Filipino American born in Fort Belvoir. <laughs> With a Southern accent. <laughs> With a Southern accent, <laughs> that's right. And, um, did you live there long? Uh, we lived there uh, after I was born there and then again traveled around. We actually moved back to Alexandria right before my father went to Vietnam. He actually bought a house for my mom and this was his second tour of Vietnam. So I, I think he wasn't sure he was going to be coming back. So he, he set up a house. But when he came back, we all packed up and then we took the next tour to Germany. And uh, so my first four years of school were in Germany. In, uh, on military base. Did you learn any German? Klein bisschen. Meine Deutsch ist nicht so gut. <laughs> and we won't go further. We won't go further than that. that. <laughs> <laughs> um, after um, the time in Germany, where did you live? Well, then my uh, father had a choice. Uh, uh, he was either going to continue working in the military uh, and we would have been transferred. I think the next uh, place was going to be Japan. But uh, we were all in in the, the military public schools. And my mom at that point was, um, we grew up Seventh-day Adventist and she really wanted us kids in uh, church schools. Mm -hmm. So after 25 years, dad retired from the military and we ended up, um, uh, in my first, by fifth grade was in a, a church school uh, in Berrien Springs, Michigan, Southwestern Michigan, near Benton Harbor, St. Joe, mm -hmm. right on the water. So we get, we get those um, Michigan Lake uh, winters uh, got used to that. I know that area well. That's I mean, my son lives near there. Okay. Um, what are some of your favorite childhood memories, Mark? Um, living in different places. Um, you know, I, uh, I think uh, 
snow <laughs> always pops up. I remember uh, growing up in the snow, and so uh, playing a lot of uh, snow sports, ice skating, skiing, sledding. Uh, we had a pond right near our house. We'd go out and play ice hockey all day long. We'd be out in the snow, uh, me and my uh, uh, sisters and brothers be out there until uh, we were called to come in and we were all covered with snow. Mm -hmm. uh, or we'd have to come in and get something to eat. But outside of that, we, I was always playing outside. It, it's interesting for me to see the kids today and you don't see them playing outside anymore. That's, that's the way we did it. But it was... Uh, close-knit family. Uh, uh, my, uh, the three younger uh, siblings, uh, including myself, are all within close age range. So we hung a lot around a lot and did a lot together. A lot of playing in the, uh, outside. I think that's a healthy thing for children. Yeah. <laughs> well, and for all of us too. Uh, one of the favorite things was uh, when it was snow day. So, you know, the, the lake effect would hit. We'd get three feet of snow. Uh, you know, they closed the schools for a few days and we turn on the roaring fire at fireplace and we play cards all day long, uh, not even thinking about school. So it, it was always playing with the siblings it was a lot of fun. And from there, where did you go? Uh, my dad had a, uh, we had our own flight business. He was a pilot and we had our own uh, business called Edquid Aviation. And uh, he moved the business to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, the year that I retired, or that I graduated, I didn't retire, graduated from high school in 79. And we, so we moved from Southwestern Michigan to uh, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And in 79, if you remember what happened in 79 in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, it was the Three Mile Island uh, uh, yeah, uh, accident. And for some reason, we were drawn. <laughs> the accident was something like in, uh, March and we ended up moving there in June or July. Uh, so that's that's why we're right there on the river in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And for college? Uh, so in college, I went to Penn State, uh, graduated, uh, I went to the main campus and then uh, finished up at the Harrisburg uh, campus, uh, the Capitol campus, they called it. So I, I remember doing that because I had um, part-time work when I was in college, uh, working for Hershey Foods and for Hershey Entertainment Resort Company. One of my favorite jobs at Hershey Entertainment Resort Company was one summer, I was the guy that went around the entire Hershey Park and I just checked all the phones. So I'd go to every booth and every ride and I'd, get, and I'd call the office and say, yeah, this phone works. Meanwhile, I'd be the only one on the roller coaster ride or the water log ride because they'd be running them for weeks before it opens. I'd be the only one on there. I'd get on every ride while I was checking all the phones. That was, that was good. And then when you work for Hearst uh, Engineering, the food company, they used to un, uh, put chocolate out, unwrapped at the offices. So you could eat as much chocolate as you wanted, you know, and, uh, that, that got old pretty soon. You just couldn't take any of it home, but there was chocolate everywhere. Everything they made at Hershey Foods was out there on the counter. That would be a wonderful job for some people. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And then, then I went home and took insulin after that. <laughs> Sweet job. Yes. After that, what was next? After graduation? Um, after graduation, I went to uh, uh, California. I worked in California uh, uh, for about eight years. And in between there, uh, I got married, went back to Harrisburg and uh, got married. Uh, my bride and I went out back out to Pennsylvania. And it was, I mean, out to California, Long Beach. Uh, worked for an engineering company out there. Uh, and it was just around, if you remember in the 90s, the Rodney King riots. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, was, it was a terrible time. Uh, I'd never seen, or hope to never see again, you know, National Guard out on the roads, uh, fires, thousands of fires started everywhere. Um, and we kind of knew it was time to go back to Pennsylvania. So we picked up and went back to Pennsylvania. Uh, and uh, uh, when we got to Pennsylvania, that's when I uh, researched careers and somehow got into uh, a nursing home. Uh, they asked me if I would uh, be interested in working as a nurse aide. And I told them, you know, my background, and I actually worked as a nurse aide uh, as a part-time job earlier in my life. Um, and I said I was interested in uh, management. So my, my degree from Penn State is in public administration. Um, and uh, I was working on my MBA uh, in organizational development uh, when we moved to Pennsylvania. And um, so I was interested in the management part. Well, they said, well, why don't you 
work under mom and pops. This was a small nursing home in the mountains of Pennsylvania. Uh, mom and pop were getting ready to retire. It was about 60 bed nursing facility. Um, and uh, they said, you operated under our license. So uh, to get your license at the time, and I think that's still today, you have to do a one year uh, internship. Mm -hmm. So that was my internship. I actually was able to run the facility with my business background, but I, that's how I learned about uh, nursing homes, dementia, uh, Alzheimer's, uh, the different care aspects of uh, skilled nursing. Uh, so th from that, I went on in other companies in skilled nursing and I ended up running rehab, Alzheimer's units, assisted living. Um, there were three facilities in Richmond, Virginia, my last three facilities that I actually managed a, a nursing home on the east side of Richmond. Um, I, I was kind of a fixer upper, so I was able to do that. They said, we need you to move to the north side. So I moved to the north side. All the meanwhile, I'm living, my wife and I were living in the south side of Richmond. Um, so, and then I ended up, my last uh, building was on the west side of Richmond. And uh, I've got to tell you, that was the one that said, okay, time to get out of healthcare. <laughs> that was a large facility with a, t took a lot of time. And it was just happening at a time that uh, things were changing in my life. So after um, that last facility, I actually um, uh, went through a change in uh, my life, um, separation in my marriage, uh, uh, which is in itself a story uh, of, uh, I think a more of a spiritual journey for me. Uh, and then, so from Richmond, Virginia, uh, I ended up in North Carolina because I had a sister that lived in North Carolina. And um, from North Carolina, I took a call to Wilmington uh, to the United Methodist Church. And so the United Methodist Church was the first place that I've been a church business administrator. But I always tell people, you know, business administration, uh, you, you still, it's the same. You're, you're managing a business. You don't want to call church a business. But it really, if you're dealing with millions of dollars in a church, it, you got to manage it like a business. You don't want to call a church a business, but when you're dealing with millions of dollars, God expects us to use his resources. He expects us to be a good steward of what he's given to us. I, that, that experience at the church and managing a church that was failing to when I left, it was an incredible growth um, where they were actually able to make some important moves recently within the, you know, the United Methodist Church changes that were going on. Um, we learned, I learned quickly that uh, how often God blows my mind, that if we're faithful in using the resources that we have to the vision and mission that he's given us, uh, he will provide. And I've n never failed to not see that. He always has a way and his answer may be no or may not be right now, but there's always a different way uh, that, that we can say yes. Maybe we didn't listen clearly when he spoke. Yeah, yeah I think so. I, I think that sometimes we have our own preconceived ideas and we want our own way. Uh, and sometimes I have to remind myself, uh, I'm not managing, what I'm managing does not belong to me. It belongs to God. And so he's asking me to handle it. That's why I think, uh, good leaders can make those decisions when they understand that it's not theirs to lead. Uh, it's theirs to lead because God gave them the uh, job to lead it, uh, but it's not their resources. So I think uh, in my life especially, he just continues to blow my mind when we're faithful to what he wants us to do. Mark, I know you have a number of hobbies and interests. Would you share some of those with us? I, I think you've alluded to music, but would you talk a little more about that? Sure, sure. Uh, music has always been a part of me. Uh, uh, to me, my music is my worship. Um, and I'll be honest with you, there's a time in my life that I uh, walked away from God. Uh, I got busy chasing a career, going up the career ladder, and I didn't have time. And what's funny is that for those years that I didn't, I drew myself further, I was withdrawn from God's presence in my life, my music also withdrew. And there were years, I had a piano, uh, and my always had a piano in my home. There were years I never played it because uh, I didn't want, uh, that, that, that always drew me closer to God. And there was just a time that maybe I'm thinking that, uh, you know, the less God knows about what I'm doing, the better it is. <laughs> <laughs> of course I know better now, but absolutely you start thinking that way. So uh, whenever, uh, don't matter, I, I'm classically trained as a teenager. Um, uh, I played in competitions, uh, some show pieces uh, that I was able to uh, win with and, 
a lot of a lot of hand movement, a lot of technical for those who do play uh, classical music is very technical, very mathematic. Uh, I I soon learned I'd rather play sports and uh, get hit than uh, you know to play the piano for eight hours a day, getting ready for those things. So I quit uh, in uh, my late teens, and then all I wanted to do was uh, just uh, I would play for churches, I would read music, but I kind of do my own thing on the piano now. It's it's still my way of worship though because when i sit down uh what i feel and what i sense is what i play i will never play a piece the same way twice it's uh, it depends on uh, on the, the audience i'm playing for the message i'm trying to get across with my fingers uh and, and it may seem more powerful at times and it may seem more contemplative at times so uh, i enjoy that part of my artistry in music um never been very good with my hands uh, people will tell you, you know, don't give him a screwdriver. He doesn't know what to do with that <laughs> thing. Um, but uh, I did like to travel. Uh, and when I travel, uh, I like uh, history. So when I go places, whether it's uh, uh, to Hawaii or uh, to the uh, Outer Banks or up to New England, I'd, I'd like to see what the history of that area is. And so some, a lot of times um, uh, my ex-wife would go to lay at the beaches, but I'd like to go see, I'd like to go on the tours and find out what's happening uh, in the local, even in the local uh, cultures. I, I always found that interesting. Uh, uh, studying uh, history uh, in military history is also an interest of mine. Um, I, get, I can get lost in a book or even in a documentary uh, where people will binge on uh, some TV shows that uh, are meaningless. I, I love to binge on uh, military history documentary uh, and see how the, the thinking and the leadership that created all of that. I find that fascinating. The, the leadership part of it does, is interesting, very interesting to me. Yeah, because, yeah. you know, so they have to make decisions. The, the, you know, there's a chain of command. There are decisions to be made. Uh, so some of them are tough decisions, but somebody has to make them. And so it's interesting to see how those decisions were made and the outcomes. Uh, I pride myself on being an outcome administrator. I want to see that everything that we're doing results in a uh, planned uh, expected outcome. Uh, otherwise, I don't, I don't want us to waste resources. If it's not going to get us to the vision at the end, uh, if the strategy is not working to get us the results and the outcomes that we're looking for, uh, I think it's a waste of uh, time and money. So um, I, I, I manage by outcomes. Did it get us here? So even talking with uh, our staff here, when we, we, we had the Autumn Fest, mm -hmm. and they're telling me, and I'm, I'm fascinated by all the things that's happening on this village. So they're telling me about the Autumn Fest. And I said, so what's the purpose of the Autumn Fest? Uh, and they would tell me, and I said, I can see the fellowship and the joy. I said, but what really should we try to get out of it as a staff? Um, not only uh, for the for the joy and the fellowship of the residents, um, I said, well, why don't we try to collect some information for those who visit? Let's get their names and numbers so that we can, sorry, but we can market to them. That's the way I think, right? So we actually, I got to tell you, in a meeting today, I found out that a resident just joined us because they attended the Autumn Fest. So we were able to uh, share what the village does and take advantage of uh, you know, sharing that information, telling the story of the village to people who are coming on that don't know us. And when they do know us, uh, we're finding that they want to know more. So trying to organize our group and organization uh, to respond to the customer and what they need is an is, um, amazing feeling and a uh, great challenge. Well, now you've been here six months? Seven months, July. July, just uh, almost seven months. Um, what has surprised you the most about being here uh, and the village, not just personally being here, but yeah, uh, I am amazed at the people who have uh, worked here for a long period of time. Their heart is here, whether they were born in the area, um, they have given their time, uh, their lives, so to speak, working for a ministry that's been in place for over, a, you know, a hundred years. And that ministry continues. That's amazing to me. Cause you know, with society changing and uh, you know, generations changing the map, that a village uh, ministry like the Advent Christian Village 
uh, is still strong and can say that this is why we exist. And the people here can repeat that. They know why they're here. Uh, and uh, you can see it in the faces. Uh, a lot of times uh, I'll ask the staff, well, how did you do this? It's interesting because I'll get an I'll get a issue or a problem or something to solve. And my first question to them is, well, how have you done this in the past? Because you've been here a hundred years. Mm -hmm. This has not surprised you. And normally they say, yeah, we've done it like this. So I've been able to watch that. I've been able to watch uh, the people uh, the residents who have also been here, their grandparents came here, their mother came here, now they're here. And so I see my goal as I want this place to be as strong as it is, as it has been, you know, when I'm gone and our grandchildren are coming up so that the place still exists and it's, and it's ready for them. We're trying to get it ready for the next generations and uh, doing it with this team is amazing. That's great. Um, I believe you said your mother was here and visited over Christmas. She did. My mom lives in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Uh, matter of fact, before she came down, my sister shot me a, a picture on my telephone uh, and she was, uh, she's 89. She'll be 89 in May. And she was out there shoveling the snow in her pajamas. <laughs> but when she was here, she was actually able to get out in 70 degree weather in uh, December and in January and walk down the streets there in the Riverwood, uh, picked up a few feathers. She came back and said, look, I found some feathers. I didn't have the nerve <laughs> to tell her they were vulture feathers. Our but mascot of the village. Our mascot of the village. But she says, they're so beautiful. And she turned one into a pen. I think she was uh, amazed that she was able to sit and have meals and discuss with people that were even older than she was and was amazed at how, uh, how much energy. So she recognized that a community such as Advent Christian Village can add years to people's lives because their lives have meaning and purpose and hope, uh, fellowship. Uh, and so I think she saw, she saw all of that. Now, if I can get her to leave Indiana where my sister is and some other family, that would be amazing. But uh, she was able to uh, share some time here with me in Florida. Well, maybe she can come back even if it's not for full time. Yeah, that's, that's right, that's right. Mark, what do you see in the next couple of years? There's what you would like to see happen in the village? Uh, Again, uh, I believe uh, as I find out what I call the DNA of the Advent Christian Village and how we want to maintain that DNA, we, we came from a certain history um, uh, and that continues to be the goal, uh, but the methods change. Mm -hmm. And so to stay uh, current, to stay appealing, to provide for the needs of the senior community, uh, I would like us to m bump up our game in terms of the methods that we deliver, the services that we deliver. There's different ways of doing things. There, uh, there's new technology out there. Uh, so there are ways that we can uh, do things more efficiently. We can do things more effectively. Um, we can still be a employer of choice in the community. And we can be a provider of choice, not only in Florida, but in our region. Uh, there's not a lot of um, continuing care retirement communities uh, that are uh, in a setting like we are. And a lot of times those places, well, you'll have to put down a large sum just to get in. A very large sum. A very large sum. I have friends that have done that. Mm -hmm. uh, and they'll never get that sum back. And at the same time, they're still paying to live there. So it is an investment, uh, but the ministry that invites people that uh, don't have the ability to do that here at the village, and we do the same thing those other retirement communities do. Um, I wanna make sure that people know uh, that care and want a place like we have, they know that we exist and that we can be a leader in this type of uh, care. Um, I, I've always been one with an organization that, uh, Advent Christian Village should be the leader in best practices. I want other people to come to us and see what, what is Advent Christian Village doing? And I think the most amazing thing that we do is in the neighborhoods that we have here on campus. Uh, there are different, we're not here to change people's walk in life. 
we're here to come alongside them. So some people have different ways that they live. But we have many different types of neighborhoods and uh, I'm, I'm actually learning to talk to the people within their neighborhoods versus talking to them in general. Because what may apply on this side of campus may not apply on that side of campus. So it's more difficult to address, what do they call that? You know, what's the easier way to eat an elephant? <laughs> piece by piece, piece. bite by bite, mm -hmm. uh, versus trying to consume the whole elephant. And uh, I'm not saying that the village is an elephant, but it's a rather large place. And it can be overwhelming if you step back and look at it, your eyes just open up and go, wow. But when you get to the resident and the neighborhoods and the preferences versus the goal of creating a safe and secure environment for retirees to live in and for employees to work at, uh, it's an amazing place to be. And I want to continue that and, and continue to develop uh, our strategies uh, to provide that into the future. Well, I'll put you on the spot for a moment if I can. And everybody ask, when is the Cat Bistro going to open? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, uh, I'll be honest with you. When I first came and my boss uh, said to me, uh, he said, Mark, I just had a meeting with the Members Association and I told him that the bistro would be, uh, or the cafe would be open by November. And he looked at me, he says, you can open that by November. I said, oh, sure, no problem. Now this is in July, mm -hmm. right? Well, little did I realize how busy this campus is in the last quarter of the year. Uh, there were more catering events there. I mean, my staff, uh, their eyes were open because they, they were pretty much new to the campus too. So being able to um, provide, uh, improve the dining program and all the services that were going on. Um, so uh, after we figured out w when all the events were happening, uh, we realized we got to step back a little bit. So it's, we were going to open it in December. Well, December was slammed with catering. January, then the equipment starting to come in. And as you can see, uh, we've had the truck out there now delivering equipment and some dry goods and soon the, the food will be in. So we're looking at February. Uh, we will be open for lunch on Wednesday and Thursdays. And then we will be open from uh, for breakfast, lunch and dinner, Fridays and Saturdays. And that's how we're gonna start opening. Uh, we'll watch to see the, uh, the response of the community to what we're doing. And uh, we'll respond in kind if, uh, if by what we see and what's happening. But I have an amazing team. Uh, Tom Iannucci, the chef and manager of that cafe, is very skilled. You guys have been able to taste some of his flavors. Uh, Arlene Yao, who is the director of food services, has the same catering background. And so they bring that in the heart. What I'm excited about is both of those people lead with the heart. Uh, they, they talk to the heart of their staff. Uh, and they speak to the heart of God when they're doing what there is that they're doing. So it's above them, but they're just being servants. And it's just amazing what's happening. Well, Mark, thank you so much. And um, we'll be at the cafe, no, the bistro. The bistro. In February. Well, we look forward to seeing you there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in today and come back for some more French Porch Conversations.